Good evening. My name is Christy Max Williams, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the November edition of this, the 24th year of the Arts Cafe Mystic. No. Oh, thank you. Thank you. November. It's a. It's a concept, isn't it? Even on a night as mild as this. Here's my favorite bardic hymn to this season. No warmth, no cheerfulness, no healthful ease, no comfortable feel in any member. No shade, no shine, no butterflies, no bees, no fruits, no flowers, no leaves, no birds, November. <laughs> I'm glad to see that you survived the storm we had last Sunday night. A wild blow, wasn't it? How many of you lost power? Yeah, that's a virtual, virtual majority. Kate and I never lost power that night, but as we sat in our living room, Shuddering under another massive gust of wind and rain, a large old oak tree fell on our house. Oh. Right on that part of the house where we were sitting, cowering under that steam storm. As you can see, we're fine. <laughs> and houses can be repaired. And on the whole, you and I and all of us could be in San Juan or Houston or Aleppo. So let's celebrate our good fortune with some poetry and music tonight. For those of you new to the Arts Cafe, our mission is to present the nation's most celebrated poets and writers, along with New England's finest musicians in programs that lift your spirits as they deepen your mind. And if we have a little fun along the way, so much the better. So let's get on with it. Our opening voice tonight is the poet and writer Peggy Dietz Shea. Now, some of you may know Ms. Shea as the author of several noted books for children, for which she has won many awards and prizes. Indeed, she is a two-time winner of the Connecticut Book Award. Her books for young readers celebrate diversity and focus on human rights, on immigrants, refugees, mental illness, gender equality, with titles like 10 Mice for Tet, The Liberty Rising, and Abe in Arms. But it is Ms. Shea's works for adult readers that concern us tonight. In fact, she has published more than 400 articles, essays, and poems for adult audiences. She teaches creative writing at UConn and the Mark Twain House, and is a founder and director of Poetry Rocks, a quarterly poetry series in Vernon, Connecticut. Ms. Shea has always thought of herself as first and foremost a poet. Her poems have appeared in many prominent journals and were included in the, in the anthologies Forgotten Women and The Kindness of Strangers. As you'll see, or as you'll hear, here hers are poems of conscience impassioned, closely observed, and edgy, but also well-crafted. But I invite you to see for yourself as you join me in welcoming Peggy Dietz Shea. Thank you, Christy, and thank you to Arts Cafe Mystic and to the Mystic Museum of Art for hosting this event. I'm very honored to be opening for, for Brenda tonight. The first poem I'm going to read is a current events poem. It's called We're Killing Ourselves. It's a sestina, and in sestinas, the, uh, the stanzas have six lines each, and you pick six words and, which are gonna appear at the end of every single line in one form or another, uh, in, in different variations in order as well. This poem has an epigraph. No honest man needs more than 10 rounds in any gun. And it was uh, said by Storm Ruger co-founder William Ruger Sr. Um, during the talks about the Brady Bill. 
He died in 1992, unfortunately. We're killing ourselves. American military life provides more safety than civilian life. Surprised? Let's take stock. In 14 years of war in Afghanistan and Iraq, loss of GIs topped 5,650. 6,000 plus suicides not counted. U.S. gun deaths double that in 2017, and the year ain't over. Only now Congress might look into opening talks on gun accessories after another white man opened fire on mostly white country concert goers, feeling safe, singing, dancing, not thinking their lives would be over in seconds because a sick, rich gambler could bump stock his semis to fully automatics. Fire rounds countless, his mind thoughtless, his shell heartless to souls lost. Kids in Sandy Hook, gays in Pulse, blacks in Chicago lost. They mean nothing to Congress members who keep their doors open to the NRA, whose gun makers haul in $8 billion a year at last count. Supplying buyers who outarm police and soldiers trying to safeguard U.S. and allies' lives. Manufacturers and dealers whose sales and stock shoot up after each massacre. Guns per household actually fell one-third since Newtown. But guns per owner jumped to over 17 firearms. Man jewelry, said one owner. The idea of losing his family and business supposedly led him to stockpile 40 weapons. But how many owners keep their gun closets open? How often do they check their firearm safeties? How unassailable is their weapon count? Because the 12,000 gun deaths a year don't count the 22,000 annual suicides by gun. It does number over 2,600 kids killed by guns each year, 14,000 more injured. Safekeeping our next generation is clearly not an American aim. Nearly losing its own members, Giffords, Scalise, shot in the wide open, could not trigger Congress to act. Listen, we are all livestock in a Second Amendment firing range. Trump, the world's laughing stock, has his tiny fingers itching for the nuke button. Nobody counts on American leadership anymore, but patriots, Terrorists were open for business. Sturm Ruger makes $1.6 million domestic and over $500 million globally a year. Hey, use our weapons to help you lose your wars. Civilians, don't gamble. You're guaranteed no safety. United Nations countries put no stock in safeguards, divided you might as well stop counting ever mounting losses. Too many fires and arms have opened. Life as we lived it is over. Thank you. I promise all these won't be so mean and <laughs> in your face, but uh, those numbers do add up. I've been working with a Syrian artist and architect in New Haven. His name is Mohammed Hafez. I would love for you to go on his uh, website. He's an amazing installation artist. This piece is an ekphrastic that, that was inspired by his installation called I Don't Know How to Swim. To produce this piece, Mohammed had refugee children in New Haven make 120 paper boats. Each boat represents 62 dead people. That makes 7,440 refugees from Northern Africa, too, who died at sea between 2014 and 2016 alone. Since January 1, 2016, more than 2,800 refugees have died. My source is the International Organization for Migration. I want to tell you just a little bit about this poem. The first part of it describes the installation itself. The second part is made up of seven tiny poems using only the words that appear in the first section of the poem. Spread sheet of death. Only art is left to testify. A number of paper boats made of loose leaves, devoid of words, sails punctured 
by metal hooks, suspend on fishing line pulled taut by sinkers, a spreadsheet of vessels not quite floating across on air, turning any which way the wind dictates, say, when people rush by, when heat flees from vents, when someone gasps, shadows of stern, bow, and belly stab at the empty wall behind. Number one, dictates puncture, boats sail, people taut, stern. Suspended, turning any which way, words fishing for lines. Three, vessels gasp devoid of wind, of words, of floats, shadows stab on empty air. Four, rush by the sinkers. Five, a boat empty leaves no shadows behind. Six, sheets spread across people devoid. Seven, on spreadsheets the numbers vent, testify, people turn away. Thank you. Um, this next, <clears throat> excuse me, next poem is called uh, Cher Tante Yvette, Dear Aunt Yvette. She and her brother Pierre were teenagers in the French Resistance, and their mother uh, was in the Resistance as well. I'm in the process of turning a young adult novel about them into an adult novel because adults still like to read about World War II. Don't you? Yes, oh, who does? Yes, keep writing. Right. Okay. Cher Tante Yvette. Your brother told me how brave you were, at only 16, spying in that Nazi calabo's office, intercepting lists of Jews in Paris to be rounded up, and warning them to flee, to follow you to the basement, and then down to the cellar, and then down further to where the dirt floor, to where the jackboots wouldn't stomp, where you'd hidden food, blankets, and hundreds of Jews before. Or they could follow you to secret garages where wagons waited to take them to safe farms in Angoulême. Please tell me, how did it feel when they said no? Certainement les enfants, no. Not even after you, panting, bruised, and bloody, after running from the Bolsh who'd found you out, raped you, beat you, left you for dead, and you still came to their door and begged them to flee. How did that feel when they said no? You said you'd left Paris after the war because there were too many ghosts. Please tell me all so you don't become one more. Okay, happy poems. I, I can do that, I can do that. I'm not a one-trick pony, I got many tricks. Um, I do like to, um, where would that book, book go? Uh, promote uh, publishers in state. So this is, was a, is a beautiful anthology called Forgotten Women, published by Grayson Books, and they're out of West Hartford. And uh, just up the road um, at Eastern Connecticut State University, they've come out with their first national journal called Here, and it's being published um, and edited by uh, Dan Donaghy, who's also um, another fantastic poet. Uh, this is a little bit of a shout out to a cousin who's here tonight, and I, I haven't seen her in a while. Um, it, it references my father, um, who was the best whistler in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the poem is called Your Bequest, and it has an epigraph by Wallace Stevens. We say ourselves in syllables, that rise from the floor, rising in speech, we do not speak. Your bequest. Daddy, you could whistle a frown off a face. Listen now to your grandson, whistling alone in the cellar, playing guitar so leisurely that each string speaks in awe of the other. 
His notes reverberate like seedlings of grass ascending through your ashes on the bottom of the sea. No wonder birds rest on ocean waves, inspired by breath from below. Thank you. Okay, anybody have any daughters here? Raise your hand if you have daughters. Okay, all right. This um, poem appeared on a website that if you like edgy stuff or, or very um, um, current events kinds of things, uh, online magazines are really good for getting those poems out. So the, the name of this website is Not Your Brother, not, I'm sorry, Not Your Mother's Breast Milk. <laughs> Give you a little idea of uh, what you might find there. And sometimes, I don't know, <laughs> my daughter plays rugby still, she's 27, and sometimes I wonder how my breast milk got into her and, and she's still just rolling around on rugby fields. Anyway, it's called Electra Strikes. Deirdre, four. Follows me into the bathroom as usual. Privacy, a fallacy. She unrolls a yard of toilet paper. Here, mommy, to wipe your penis. <laughs> Honey, remember, boys have penises, girls have vaginas. Oh, yeah, well, my vagina is prettier than your vagina. <laughs> it is? How come? Yours has hair. Oh, you will grow hair, too, in a few days, a few years, rather. Mm. Well, my hair will be prettier than your hair. <laughs> and just like that, she slays me. <laughs> I haven't been able to publish this poem, but I, it gets calls for, um, you know, encores, for me to read it. It's, uh, it's a little irreverent. But it's the right time of year, it's a harvest season, and we grow carrots every year. Uh, this is called Carrots for Christmas. Seeds, pale commas, impossible to sow one at a time. Instead, I trickle them inside the perimeter of our 10 by 20 foot plot. In table pose, I thin the carrots again and again, telling myself the back ache is worth it, the taste on Christmas. But when I pluck a robust seedling instead of a withered one, I'm a suburban series spurned by Darwin. How am I to know what potential grows in an underworld tilled by worms? When I confess my ignorance, my priest friend laughs. He just snip every other shoot. Ah, right, elementary, science and religion, little thrives without light. Now at Christmas, I clear the snow, bang, banging the frozen soil, shovel clanging, bones ringing, and lever up orange gold. Oh, bless me, Father for I am seeing the ghosts of lovers past splayed at my feet. Heroic stumps, knobby thumbs, six inchers, fine ribbed, Coney Island footlongs, stunted twins conjo conjoined at the crown. Have I grown horns? No matter the shape, they all come to the same conclusion, steamy, buttery jewels on my holiday spread. God bless each and every one. Thank you. Peggy Deetche, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Thank you, Peggy. Um, I'm pleased to say that we have several of Peggy's uh, books for young audiences on sale for you tonight. If you're looking for an early holiday present, this might be the place to get it. 
And this gives me the opportunity to thank our good friends from Bank Square Books for their support and for providing Brenda Shaughnessy's books for sale tonight. As we all know, Mystic is lucky to have so hip and friendly a bookstore, an independent bookstore. Hmm. I also want to thank the Mystic Museum of Arts for welcoming the Arts Cafe again. Our community is fortunate to have such a resource, and we are grateful to be at home here. So, tonight's musical interlude will be served up by the J. Hunter Group, which performs that most wonderful musical conversation we call jazz. If you get out much at night in these parts, you will have encountered these musicians in various combinations and venues, which is part of what makes the jazz conversation so interesting, so, so good. The good players knowing the topics to be discussed, that is, the standard tunes we all know and love. But like all good conversations, theirs is an improvisation. But I wonder if you, if you realize how accomplished these players are. Did you know, for example, that the band leader, Jim Hunter, is also a longtime member of the string section of the Eastern Ch Connecticut Symphony? Did you know that pianist Rufus Baby Grand Davis has been affiliated with the London Symphony, the Eastern Connecticut Symphony, and has toured the country with the National Theater for the Performing Arts. Did you know that drummer Randy Cloutier recently toured the music of The Temptations, featuring Barrington Bo Henderson, one of the original temps? And did you know that the wonderful saxophone player Cedric Mayfield has toured the nation and the world as a member of the U.S. Coast Guard Band? My friends, these are some of the region's finest musicians, and we are fortunate tonight for the opportunity to eavesdrop on their musical conversation. So won't you please join me in welcoming the Jay Hunter Group.
I've been looking forward to this. To begin with, Brenda Shaughnessy was born in Okinawa, raised in California, went to grad school in New York City, and lives now in New Jersey, <laughs> which proves once again that we all have to be from somewhere. <laughs> but doesn't it also say something about being American, about the uniqueness and diversity of the somewheres we're all from. Along the way, Ms. Shaughnessy has published four celebrated books of poems, including her breakthrough collection, Our Andromeda, which the New Yorker called a monumental book, and which the New York Times recognized as one of the 100 best books of 2012. Our Andromeda was also a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Griffin Poetry Prize. Ms. Shaughnessy's second book, Human Dark with Sugar, won the James Laughlin Award of the Academy of American Poets. And one prominent critic described her latest book, So Much Synth, as simply gorgeous. Ms. Shaughnessy has also received a Guggenheim Fellowship, among others, and she's currently a professor at Rutgers. So much for her glittering CV. At mid-career, Brenda Shaughnessy has earned a reputation for, and I quote, writing poems that absolutely matter. In poem after poem, her plain spoken honesty is both fierce and brave. Yet love is her great theme, or how we love, or how we muster love in the face of heartbreak and confusion. How we love as parents, siblings, friends, and how especially we learn to love ourselves. Her poems are urgent and original for their subject matter. For example, in Our Andromeda, she writes of giving birth to then caring for her disabled son, poems of huge pain and tenderness. As a mother to a daughter in so much synth, she works through our collective legacy and her personal experience of sexual and domestic violence, poems of immense candor and courage. But Ms. Shaughnessy's poems are also esteemed for their sophisticated humor and playful language. No other poet I know of constructs a line or turns a phrase with such energy and originality. Indeed, Brenda Shaughnessy is a poet at the top of her game, and some game it is. And we're lucky to hear from her tonight, so won't you please join me in welcoming Brenda Shaughnessy. I was promised a cubby, <laughs> and there it is. Uh, thank you for that absolutely beautiful introduction, Christy. I really appreciate it. Um, I don't envy myself following that music. I really don't. Um, I hope you can feel for me, because I am just so dazzled, and all I want to do is think about it and bliss out. But here I am, here we all are. I thank you for being here with me. Um, so thank you to the Arts Cafe Mystic and to the museum. This is truly a privilege and I'm delighted. Um, it was a pleasure to share the stage with you, um, Peggy and the J Hunter group as well. Visitor, I am dreaming of a house just like this one, but larger and opener to the trees, nighter than day and higher than noon, and you visiting, knocking to get in, hoping for icy milk or hot tea or whatever it is you like, for each night is a long drink in a short glass, a drink of black sound water, such a rush and fall of lonesome no form can contain it. 
And if it isn't night yet, though I seem to recall that it is, then it is not for everyone. Did you receive my invitation? It is not for everyone. Please come to my house lit by leaf light. It's like a book with bright pages filled with flocks and glens and groves and overlooked by Pan, that seductive satyr in whom the fish is also cooked. A book that took too long to read, but minutes to unread, that is, to forget. Strange are the pages thus, nothing but the hope of company. I made too much pie in expectation. I was hoping to sit with you in a treehouse, in a nightgown, in a real way. Did you receive my invitation? Written in haste before leaf blinked out, before the idea fully formed. An idea like a storm cloud that does not spill or arrive, but moves silently in a direction. Like a dark book in a long life with a vague hope in a wood house with an open door. So some of you might know this wonderful word, artless. It sounds, it's got a kind of a double meaning and people often think it means without grace or without um, creativity or design know-how or something, but it, most of you probably know that what it actually means is sort of without guile, without artifice. Um, but it has that kind of double shimmer to it. Artless is my heart. A stranger berry there never was. Tartless, gone sour in the sun. In the sunroom or moonroof, ruthless. No poetry, plain. No fresh special recipe to bless. All I've ever made with these hands and life. Less substance, more rind. Mostly rim and trim. Meatless, but making much smoke in the old smokehouse, no less. Fatted from the day, overripe and even toxic at eve. Nonetheless, in the end, if you must know, if I must bend, wasteless to that excruciation, no marvel, no harvest left me speechless. Yet I find myself somehow with heart, aloneless, with heart, fighting fire with fire, flightless. That loud hub of us, meat stub of us, beating us senseless. Spectacular in its way, its way of not seeing, congealing dayless but in everydayness. In that hopeful haunting, a lesser way of saying in darkness. There is silencelessness for the pressing question. Heart, what art you? War, star, part, or less? Playing a part, staying apart from the one who loves, loveless. So, does anyone have any sisters here? Peggy had asked if people had daughters. Um, but I want to know if you have sisters. I have one. She's super annoying. <laughs> so when I call her, I want to talk to my sister. And then she goes on and on and talks about what she bought at Target. And I think, I just wish I had another sister to call. <laughs> Anyone but you. But she feels the same. I wish I had more sisters. I wish I had more sisters, enough to fight with and still have plenty more to confess to, embellishing the fight so that I look like I'm right. And then I turn all my sisters one by one against my sister. <laughs> one sister will be so bad the rest of us will have a purpose in bringing her back to where it's good with us and we'll feel useful and she'll feel loved. Then another sister will have a tragedy and again, we will unite in our grief, judging her much less than we did the bad sister. This time it was not our sister's fault. This time it could have happened to any of us, and in a way it did. We'll know she wasn't the only sister to suffer. We all suffer with our choices, and we all have our choice of sisters. My sisters will seem like a bunch of alternate me, all the ways I could have gone. 
I could see how things pan out without having to do the things myself. <laughs> the abortions, the divorces, the arson, swindles, poison jelly. But who could say they weren't myself? We're so close. I mean, who can tell the difference? I could choose to be a fisherman's wife since I'd be able to visit my sister in her mansion, sipping bubbly for once, braying to the others who weren't invited. I could be a traveler, a seer, a poet, a potter, a fly swatter. None of those choices would be as desperate as they seem now. My life would be like one finger on a hand, a beautiful, usable, ringed, rung, piano and dishpan hand. There would be both more and less of me to have to bear. None of us would be forced to be stronger than we could be. Each of us could be all of us, the pretty one, the smart one, the bitter one, the unaccountably happy for no reason one. I could be, for example, the hopeless one, and the next day my sister would take my place, and I would hold her up till my arms gave way, and another sister would relieve me. So this is a, a very short transcript of a conversation that happened in real life with my five-year-old daughter. The poem is called Homeschool. I don't homeschool, and this is why. <laughs> uh, so the two characters are Simone, my daughter, and me. Simone, what's emergency cash? Me. Cash is money. So emergency cash is money you have in case you need it for emergencies. Simone, in case you have too much cash in an emergency, you might need money. Me, um, no, let me see how I can explain it. If you have an emergency, you might need money, but if you don't have money, you'd use emergency cash. Simone, oh, if you run out of money, you can just get more money from the emergency cash that you have. <laughs> I just hated myself after that. I can do this wrong. So, you know, I have a time machine, and so do you. Each of us is our own time machine. I have a time machine, but unfortunately, it can only travel into the future at a rate of one second per second, <laughs> which seems slow to the physicists and to the grant committees and even to me. But I managed to get there time after time to the next moment and to the next. Thing is, I can't turn it off. I keep zipping ahead. Well, not zipping. And if I try to get out of this time machine, open the latch, I'll fall into space, unconscious, then desiccated. And I'm pretty sure I'm afraid of that, so I stay inside. There's a window, though. It shows the past. It's like a television or fish tank. But it's never live, it's always over. The fish swim in backward circles. Sometimes it's like a rear view mirror, another chance to see what I'm leaving behind. And sometimes like blackout, all that time wasted sleeping. Myself, age eight, whole head burnt with embarrassment at having lost a library book. Myself lurking in a candled corner expecting to be found charming. Me, holding a rose, though I want to put it down so I can smoke. Me, exploding at my mother who explodes at me because the explosion of some dark star all the way back struck hard at mother's mother's mother. I turn away from the window, anticipating a blow. I thought I'd find myself an old woman by now, traveling so light in time. But I haven't gotten far at all. Strange not to be able to pick up the pace as I'd like. The past is so horribly fast. Um, don't you love it when someone starts a sentence with, in this economy? <laughs> it's the worst. In this economy. The economical ikebana of the lesser octopus is disarming. A sextopus holding its intelligence and ink in a concentrate. Not some sloppy octopus who suddenly freaks, so princessy, rich, 
driven to abstraction, not unlike flowers dropping their petals, because petals are garbage off the bloom, not expensive anymore, thus going inside to find meaning. Cut the eyes, then, from the cruel Ikebana of the racehorse. If a leg breaks, she can't bear her own weight. Long-blossomed head turns to glue, and the fortune zooms off like flies from a carcass when shooed. The tripod fell, so I had to cast about for my crutch to walk over. My bad left me buckling to write it. I want to take a picture of the flowers I arranged after an Ikebana class. Just one. I quit quickly, but still hope to learn to arrange beauty classically. Maybe I'm lazy or don't apply the rules to myself. Or maybe laze is just zeal rearranged. <laughs> As in my case, even now, the clock we need to punch out on is too far away to plug in, so power collects in its hands. I have a bunch of futuristic dystopian <laughs> poems that, I, that are painful. Um, this is our beloved infinite crapulence. <laughs> in Indiana, in the era of hell wealth, way past deadline, someone on the account is sweating it, making metaphor from what is already unreal. And because he wants to go home to his farm fresh slowpoke foam, grown cold, we are eventually diagnosed with winter and treated to this marketing copy off a tube of cream, undry your skin, or a rainforest for your face. I bought it. It seemed fresh and felt organic, and like it would at least wet me skin-wise. I can't feel my old ambition to be racked with anguish or to grow soft with loss. When I lose, I'm still so grateful. Does that make me a chump or a champ, eating victory muscles in the lamplight of my domestic tranquility? Gratitude often leaves me with nothing to say, as when I saw you in the toy store, I felt like a feral cat who knows only the dumpsters and the flu-scented sandboxes of now. Now that I'm happy, I suppose I have to break my own heart just to feel something. Another person with my same name goes around impersonating others. Now everyone thinks I'm the imposter. I want to tell her, you know, you think you know me, sipping mahogany cider in the millionaire's billiards room, but there is such a thing as too much umami, and there's no way to rest forever and then go on. Someone once said, now that I'm happy, I suppose I have to break my own heart to feel something. I should remember that. I should stop praying to my dead self. I should pull out my earbuds and hear the world, my first love, my favorite store, without continually moving my oiled jaw hinge. If it's literal, it's obvious. Too literal, it's stupid. So why be real? I like a chemical mysticism performed with perfect innocence. The wet slit lit up and cut down the middle. A little spit, lip, a little bit split. Love in the candle shop, wicked. Peeing into a plastic water bottle, wasteful. <laughs> These are scents. As is, luck be a lady, so spend your whole social security check on lottery tickets, be a gentleman. <laughs> I, want to spell like, I want to smell like ceramic wind in the canyon, a brittle lust, a red-headed remedy synonymous with flooding, weather vane rusted stuck, a stranger's phalanges, the South Mouth, Fiercely Phlegm, Fun Old Lady, So Parachute. <laughs> Those are titles of perfumes. I liked Fiercely Phlegm. <laughs> and now we eat, the eponymous eating. Don't want butter, don't want salt. Dinner is thinner, but it's not my fault. We're having fungal celebrity of beef cheeks tomorrow, so get yourself hungry. For lighter fare, I prefer the soapish fish braised in its own frothing broth, served with an aromatic retraction of statements previously made in the shade of a giant genetically muddled with fiddlehead fern, infused with expelled chipmunk breath. 
I, I love this local company, especially because for every order, and this is so cool, they make a tax-deductible contribution in honor and support, to honor and support the world-famous Pacific Garbage Patch in your name. <laughs> So this is a funny little story. I, I had a chance to go to the McDowell Colony, um, and it meant I had 17 days away from my little kids and my responsibilities, and I was able to sort of write. And this was very hard one. It was not something that I could get to do very often at all. And so I went, I very, very, very guilty, guiltily left my children and went and sat in this little cabin, and then I just sat there with my pen on a piece of paper waiting for four days, and nothing happened, and I was totally mortified. Um, but I couldn't get this thought out of my head. Before I had left, I had thrown a little birthday party at like a gymnastics place for my daughter, and, um, and I couldn't get this one image out of my head of this little boy just shoveling blueberries into his mouth. Just like a machine, like a blueberry shoveling machine. And I just, I just thought, well, I don't, why would I write about that? I don't want. To, I didn't leave my family just so I can go go to the New Hampshire woods in a cabin to write about the birthday party that I just had for the kid. But I just went with it instead. This is blueberries for Cal. <laughs> Watching little Henry six scoop up blueberries and shovel them into his mouth, possessed. I'm so glad I brought blueberries. Wish my kids could would eat them. Cal can't. Simone won't. Henry's sisters, Lucy and Jane, took turns feeding each other goldfish crackers and sips of juice, arms around each other's neck and back, tiny things. I wish my daughter had a sister like that. And my son, a nervous system that let him walk and munch berries. Sometimes I can't bear all the things Cal doesn't get to do. I want to curse everything I can't give him. Admire, compare. Despair, that's not the most real feeling I'm feeling, is it? I feel joy in Henry's joy. Blueberries for the child who wants them. There's all this energetic sweetness, enough to go around, to give and taste and trust more than enough. For Cal, too, I want to remember this. My children seem to subsist on music and frosting. Where there's frosting, there's cake. Where there's music, someone chose to make a song over all other things on this earth. You know how there are all these new jobs? Like, well, I can't think of any right now. But there are these new jobs that you've never heard of before. They're all invented and they're all brand new and no one can get them. But I think there should be a job, like a, like a, well, like a book shrink that you go to when you're writing a book. <laughs> At the book shrink, one learns to say, my body uses me as a grape uses wine, to talk about inevitability, the essence of plot. But what happens when a person understands she is being sent back glass by glass, to the invisible pouring stations of the larger narrative. That she is merely like or likely a person in a book. Like a saltwater balloon sinking in the ocean. Like a person in a book, like I said already. Someone's not listening. Someone's eating breakfast or falling asleep or texting a married lover as shrinks are wont to do. If I am boring, then at least I am getting somewhere. Through the wood I knock on. My story is telling, but it's not telling me. I need help getting to the next part. When I open my mouth, liquid rushes in and drunkening. When I close it, dark, secret-looking drops spill crimson on the page. This is a poem that's sort of hard to read. But I changed their name, so it's okay. <laughs> this is the new people. 
I had no desire to get to know the screamers, our loud in ten ways, annoying, drunken, boorish neighbors. But I didn't put up a fence or anything. Didn't fight it when they brought us plates of their fatty meals and overlong chit-chat. We were new, just renting, and I didn't want to be rude. Either when Joanna and Vince brought us their statue of the Virgin Mary when our newborn son was in the hospital. Joanna had tears in her eyes, and though I am not Catholic or even Christian, or not anymore anyway, I think if it's like what I suppose in that you have to keep up with the dues to stay in the club, I accepted the statue. I took in the alien mother and wrapped her in a blanket. I lay her on a low shelf and broke the news to my Jewish husband, who cringed and said, she gave you what? But I didn't care what it was, from what god or goddess or neighbor or creature or kiln. I was becoming something I didn't know each day without my little boy, near insanity about his tiny, pure, hurt self. All those wires. Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, holy statue in my baby's silent room, I promise I will believe in you and in Jesus too, please. Why was I cradling a mother statue, a ceramic doll, this creepy relic instead of my beautiful living son? If she could make it all the way here across so many territories of indifference into my most secret empty room, surely my child who belonged would come home soon? The home team. I liked Jane's team. I'd bet money on them, but it wasn't that kind of thing. Too disorganized, plus it was just lunchtime pickup winter ball with deflated goal bulbs and not enough of the good knee gel to go around. The kids were tough. The kids goofed. Jane shone. She worried that winter ball like a craft. Then, like it was nothing, she'd plifted it dead center while everyone else looked sleepy, sidewise, a full surprise every time. Her main move, always a low private conversation with the air. Then lightning knees you could never see. The rest of the team shot sparks on occasion. Tella's swift half-bank could rattle the shoulder of the thickest bulb guard, and the brain, a sticky girl in advanced graphmatics, had all the angles. We stood in the stands like snipers, trying to see what the brain did, but never did till the fluke score landed from outer space. Jane again, invisibly. Some girls thought winter ball too mean-streaked, too psychic. My oldest daughter could hardly watch, preferring hockey. They shared a season, so it was one or the other in our town. My younger daughter would rather ice swim, but even in her ice hole in the lake, her eyes followed Jane. Our hearts were in Jane's feet, her hands. All the bills we couldn't pay, the wishing for electricity and lit up screens of pleasure, the food gone rotten because no one could bring themselves to eat it. Jane gave us so many more chances to do it right this time. We couldn't give our kids the bountiful, bulletproof homes we wanted, but we could insist on watching them try to win their childhoods back inspecting their scraped knees before the raw red and pink dappled wounds turned burgundy into crusts of edible leather. Wellness rituals. You never understood me until you watched me wash the inside of the well with clean well water and invisible soap, which dissolves the dirt and then clumps up and floats on the surface, suddenly iridescent. I net up the greening lumps, skimming. I leave out the net to dry. Within hours, the lumps are coagulated and bacterial, dirty heads striated with living question marks, leech pieces, worm eyes, segments of fertile sediment. Enough biomaterial to assemble themselves into flying animals, little glowing spitballs. They waver off into their new lives. I made them as surely as I made my daughters without knowing how. I washed down the sides with sea sponge as far as my arms could go, then lowered myself in the bucket. Down there I used my feet, scrubbed the stones and cracks of moss and slime, and what else? Dead water, new algae, legs of things. I held my breath against the earth perfume in case it was infected and spread my legs to straddle the diameter, my toes clenched on wet grit, my own holes amphibian as ever. Where does my water come from? 
from myself, you know. I am a self-cleaning animal, and my children were born glistening under all the soft trees leaving, breathing. You understand me now. The well was always clean. I clean it anyhow. It is no cleaner now than it was, but I am. I'm going to read one poem from my, um, from my first book, which came out in the last millennium. Yeah. Dear Ganglia, Ganglia was a lover of Sappho's. I believe that's the um, origin of that name. Or a crush that Sappho had. Dear Ganglia, the most inscrutable, beautiful names in this world always do sound like diseases. It is because they are engorged. Gee, I am a fool. What we feel in the solar plexus wrecks us. Halfway squatting on a crate where feeling happened, caresses. You know, corporeal gifts besmirch thieves like me. But she plucks a feather and my steam escapes. We're awake each night at penny moon and we micro and necro. I can't stop but love and what all. The uncomfortable position of telling the truth, like the lotus, can't be held long. If she knew, would she just take all her favors from my marmalade vessel and chuck them back into the endless reversible garment, which is my life? An astonishing vanishing. Gee, I know this letter is like a slice of elevator accident. As smart folk would say, everything is only nothing's truck. I would revise it and say that everything is only nothing, truncated. Love, your Igor. <laughs> I'll finish with this one. It's called Noctroclochite. After Kaja Silverman's book, Flesh of My Flesh, in which she talks about the Orpheus myth and uh, Freud. Noctroclochai, as you'll sort of hear in the poem, is sort of, uh, um, it's what, what Freud formulated as um, the, the idea of a second life. Um, but we would call it post-traumatic stress. We would call it sort of a, like a, re, a sort of need to reenact. Nectroclochite. On having slashed myself from throat to instep on, in one unbroken line, I suppose it was a reenactment. Freud's Nectroclochite, the second act. The past presses so hard on the present, the present is badly bruised. Blood brims under the skin. That was the situation I was in. Wearing a jacket of blood from an earlier crime, which was also mine. A curving zipper with misaligned teeth open to show red lipstick, meat, and a stage smile, have a seat. Normally, I'm much more careful. Naturally, something like this would only ever happen in a dream. But even dreams have their dreams of finding their dreamer awake, silent within earshot, carving knife in hand. Did you know that anguish thins the blood and thickens the vessel? It was like cutting a rare steak, a minotaur, glittering with rubies and pink candles. My hands hung like electrical wires off a building on the edge of collapse, every one of my gestures symbolic, ruined of magic. For there is no miraculous beast, and there never was, standing on the golden field of frozen honey clover, each leaf strong enough to bend under everything's weight, strong because it bends because it has already been crushed, but its cells know that blight, one massive cut, will slit each tiny skin surgically in order to save the field from itself. I cannot suffer the same fate twice, force my own hand or stay it. Can't repeat or unrepeat. This finitude is infinite and infinitely expanding. Thank you. Brenda Shaughnessy, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you, Brenda. Isn't that great stuff? Uh, thanks also to the Jay Hunter Band and to Peggy Dietzsche. For those of you who would like to take Brenda Shaughnessy home with you tonight, we'd prefer that you take one or two of her books instead. Uh, we have them all. The, the wonderful Our Andromeda, Human Dark with Sugar, So Much Synth. We've got them all. Um, as always, our final thanks are to you, our audience. The Arts Cafe is a tribute to you, my dears, for your curiosity, your good humor, your toleration. Hmm, this is community, my friends, and don't it feel good? Good night. <laughs>